president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, Jeffrey Rosen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. It is such an honor to welcome you to our national First Amendment teach-in and the opening of our new First Amendment gallery. And it's so meaningful to be standing here in front of the shining words of the First Amendment. And let's inspire ourselves for the conversation ahead by now gazing at Independence Hall, the room where it happened, the birthplace of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which gave rise to the shining protections for freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and petition that we're here to celebrate today. Friends, please visit the First Amendment gallery before you leave. And when you do, in this magnificent new space, you'll see two documents at the beginning of the exhibit. Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia, and Louis Brandeis's Great Defense of Free Speech in Whitney versus California. And you'll see at the beginning of the exhibit, Jefferson praising what he called the illimitable freedom of the human mind, based on the principle that, as he put it, the opinions of people, being dependent on evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot be controlled by others. Freedom of speech and opinion is a natural right, he said, because our opinions are the product of our reason, and our reason cannot be alienated or surrendered to any king or tyrant or fellow citizen. We have the right and the duty to think for, as we will and speak as we think, as Jefferson said, quoting the great Roman historian, historian Tacitus. And then Louis Brandeis, in his Whitney in California opinion, channeled Jefferson's beautiful words and insisted that the freedom to think as we will and speak as we think is at the core of the First Amendment. Today, we've assembled some of the greatest scholars and thinkers about the First Amendment in America to examine the historic roots of those words, their contemporary contestations in the courts, and how they're playing out online. Uh, and I need to thank our incredible partners for having assembled this national celebration and defense of the First Amendment, and they include, uh, I need my constitutional reading glasses to make sure I have all of them, the First Amendment Watch at NYU, FIRE, the Great Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, the Freedom Forum, PEN America, and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and I'm so grateful to Steve Solomon at NYU's First Amendment Watch for having had the brilliant idea that led to us convening today. Friends, we are extraordinarily honored to begin our convocation by hearing from one of the great free speech heroes in the world today. It's so meaningful that Salman Rushdie has agreed to share with us his thoughts on threats to freedom of expression. No figure in the globe more powerfully reminds us of the wickedness of those who would try to suppress blasphemy and heresy with violence, and the shining need to defend principles of free speech against all forces of illiberalism and suppression. And uh, joining uh, us to interview Salman Rushdie is a great defender of free speech and a great friend of the National Constitution Center, Suzanne Nossel, the visionary head of PEN America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Suzanne Nossel and Salman Rushdie. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Salman. Hi. Hello, Great everybody. Great to see you. That's very nice. It's great to be here uh, for this auspicious event, uh, and thank you so much to Steve and Jeff and everybody who has made it possible. 
So, Solomon, to begin, I mean, I, I think of that incredibly inspiring moment when in your, your first appearance publicly since the attack, you came to the Pen America Gala and inspired us with your words and talked uh, about those who helped save your life uh, when you were attacked last summer. And you ended your remarks saying, la lutte continue, and putting your fist up in the air. And it was sort of just this rousing moment uh, that we are of a reminder that we are in this fight for the long term. And to begin with, I, I wanted just your overview uh, of the horizon and what you see as the major threats to free speech and press today here in the US and around the world. Well, well, first of all, let me just say I'm really happy to be a part of this important event, and thank you for having me. Um, you know, the First Amendment was one of the reasons why I decided to come and live in America. You know, it was one, it was one of the great American values that made me think that's a place I'd like to live, if, if those are the values of the society. And I, and I had always assumed that that would be something which, which all Americans would, so to speak, hold sacred. And you ask about what the problems nowadays are. I mean, if you'd asked me 10 or 20 years ago, I would probably have said that the main problems facing freedom of expression emanate from relig religious extremism, you know, from, um, of all kinds, from Islamic extremism, which I have some personal experience of, but also Hindu fanaticism in India and Christian extremism in this country. Um, the, 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 the destruction of Roe v. Wade being an example of what that can do. Um, I'm not sure that I would give that answer in the same way now, because it, in a way it feels it feels like a kind of 18th century answer. It feels as if we're still fighting the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment fighting against what was then the main enemy of free expression, which was the church, more than the state. Um, I think now we are facing another old enemy, which is authoritarianism. Uh, I, think, I think there's a, a real rise in authoritarian movements around the world, uh, populist authoritarian demagoguery, and coupled with that, a willingness amongst at least some part of the population to, to, to cease to value uh, the democratic values uh, enshrined in the First Amendment. So I think the problem is, I would now say, m political more than primarily religious. And how do you make sense of the ways in which, even in this country, these authoritarian tendencies and a readiness to, for example, ban books, uh, enact laws that circumscribe what can be taught in the college classroom. You know, how has that taken hold in this place that you came to as a beacon not so long ago? How do you explain it and how do we get past it? I find it bewildering and I think it has to do with two kinds of attack that have been, has been, have been unleashed not unsuccessfully in recent years. One is on the idea of education itself. Um, I mean, I remember seeing some years ago a survey uh, carried out amongst Republican voters in which something like two thirds of them subscribed to the idea that universities were bad for America. Uh, because they were places where people were indoctrinated with, you know, communism and so forth. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is the, the thing that you and I, Suzanne, have talked about a lot, which is the assault on the idea of the truth. Uh, because one of, the, one of the preconditions for the rise of um, authoritarian strongmen is that people cease to believe in the truth. People are told so often that what everything they're being told is a lie, that they begin to internalize that. And at that point, the demagogue, the authoritarian can rise to his feet and can say, I am the truth. Believe me, because I am the truth. That's how 
dictatorship start. That's how tyrannies in, rise. And we're seeing phenomena like that in this country, but around the world as well. You know, and, and um, those two attacks on education, on the, on the value of education, and on the absolute value of the truth you know, are, are unfortunately have been, have been to some degree successful. Shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about censoriousness emanating from the left. You know, at PEN America, we've spent a lot of time and energy trying to set out how the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion can and must be reconciled with free speech. And to us, it seems crucially important because the rising generation in this country too often sees free speech and the First Amendment as a smokescreen for hatred. And we feel if we don't explain how these ideals can fit together, how free speech protections can enable the movements that young people are waging, we are at risk of free speech losing its moorings in our society. But mm -hmm. you know, in dialogue with you sometimes over the years, I, I wonder you know, whether you feel that's the right approach or whether you think it's a, something of a distraction or, or a detraction from the unflinching defense of free speech. Do you ultimately think these values can be reconciled? I hope so. I hope so. Um, and I do think that pro the problem that you describe, the problem of the, the kind of progressive attack on, 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 on free speech, uh, is so far anyway, seems to be a province of the very young. Um, so there's a bit of me that thinks maybe they'll grow out of it. Um, I do think that you know, different countries define free expression differently. So that, for example, when I was living in, in the UK for a long time, the UK has a thing called the Race Relations Act. Uh, the Race Relations Act makes it illegal to make racially charged remarks. You can be prosecuted and sent to jail. And, and when I lived in England, I didn't see anything much wrong with that. I thought, okay, racism is against the law. Why not? You know, um, the First Amendment defines speech more broadly than that. And when I moved to America, I came to appreciate that. I came to think, okay, let's hear all the voices so that we can, so that we know where the bastards are, you know, so that we can fight back against them. Um, but I can understand both arguments. You know, I mean, I, I, I do think to this day in the UK, people on the left and the right value the Race Relations Act. You know, it's, it's, it's seen as being worth it. So I think one of the things that maybe might be worth debating in this, in this uh, convention is that question about whose definition of free expression works best in the current climate. You know? For example, in Germany, it's a crime. Holocaust denial is a crime. You know? and, and I mean, you can see why, uh, given the history of Germany. Um, I still, my view is that that's a real mistake. Um, that Holocaust denial doesn't disappear by being made illegal, you know, and, and um, in some way it acquires a kind of, it acquires the glamour of taboo. You know, um, forbidden things are glamorous. And, and I think um, Holocaust denial should be presented as being astonishingly unglamorous, you know, which it is. So, uh, what I'm saying is that there, is a dis that there isn't simply a thing called free expression. There is, it's individual Western societies have made up their own minds about where that line should be drawn. And I've always liked the very broad definitions of the United States. Uh, um, um, I do think there, is, there are problems arising out of new technology. There are problems based on what the internet makes possible and there are problems based on what social media make possible. So the abuses of free expression that are rampant on, on the internet and on social media do create a problem for us, you know, and I think it's, it's some, I'm not even sure what my answer to that is, um, but, it's a, but it's something we need to seriously think about. Yeah, I wanted to, I mean, when you, when you mentioned Holocaust denial, one thing 
that comes to my mind is, you know, in addition to the points you raised about why it's problematic to try to suppress it and how that doesn't ultimately work, it also becomes a template. You know, and uh, when I worked at the U.S. State Department, we were trying to fend off an effort at a global ban on the defamation of religion. And one of the prime arguments that the Islamic countries brought forward was that in many countries, Holocaust denial is banned. And if you're going to ban you know, that which is offensive to Jews or might fan anti-Semitism, why won't you ban that which is offensive to us and might fan anti-Muslim sentiment? And we always, as the US, had a very good argument, which is we wouldn't permit the banning of Holocaust denial in this country. And you know, that ultimately, I think, made a big difference. It would have been a much harder fight to win uh, you know, if that prohibition was universal. But I want to come back to the question of social media, because I think this is a real dilemma. I think we all basically accept far more restriction, the notion that far more restriction of speech on social media is legitimate, that the kind of community standards that a platform like Facebook or Instagram has, or the rules of the road that Twitter traditionally had, allow those platforms to be functional, allow a real give and take that doesn't become uh, you know, just a race to the bottom in terms of vitriol and disinformation, taking over the platform, doing what you described in terms of uh, an underpinning of authoritarian societies where you can't ferret out the truth. Uh, there's no route to truth. It's so flooded with disinformation, no one can figure out what to believe. But you know, the question is, there have also been very staunch kind of backlash against some of those restrictions. People arguing that speech is being suppressed on conservative uh, versus liberal lines, that important uh, topics about the vaccines and COVID and the origins of COVID have been suppressed, the interplay between government and social media companies. So I, I wonder, you know, Elon Musk is sort of throwing those rules out the window uh, and making his forum much more of a free-for-all. Is, is your instinct that that's the right answer or that, you know, we somehow have to muddle through and develop these kind of ever more elaborate rules to try to govern what is and isn't permissible on social media? And, I, I, you know, I ask you also as someone who's active uh, on Twitter and uh, on Facebook and uh, does engage in dialogue in those fora. I mean, I, I engage a little bit. You know, what, what, I, what I have found is that increasingly it's become an unpleasant place to be. Um, I, I feel that whatever you should call this, I mean, I don't, X, you know, um, um, feels like a room you don't want to be in, a room full of people you don't want to talk to. And, and so I, I, I go on relatively little. I, I do sometimes think that all other media, broadcast or print, all other media, are subject to a certain kind of regulation, which is to say, an editorial regulation. That's to say that, that books, television programs, radio, films, are held to be editorially responsible for their content, you know, and, and um, and this is why publishing companies have book editors as opposed to just pushing out anything that anybody sends them. Um, this is why newspapers have book editors. And you know, for example, in the fight that we were involved in about the Charlie Hebdo murders, um, the editorial decisions of a magazine like that uh, are often disagreed with by members of the magazine. So, uh, but somebody, the buck stops somewhere. You know, there's, there is in the end an editor's desk who has to make choices. And that is true of every single other medium that has ever existed, print or broadcast. Now we have this new thing which, is, which functions like the Wild West, you know, uh, where you can ride into Dodge with a gun because, hey, we believe in freedom. You know? um, so the question is whether some of the principles that, that, that govern all other media can somehow be applied to these new media. And, and uh, I'm by no means equipped to answer how, because it's a really difficult problem. Um, but I do think there's something that needs to be really thought about, because it's not true in any other form of expression uh, that, that you can just uh, shoot your mouth off without consequences. 
Right. I mean, you know, if you go back to the early days of the internet, that ability that it affords to just shoot your mouth out you know, immediately uh, and reach an audience, you know, sometimes of hundreds of thousands or even millions, mm. if what you've said or what you've shown is potent enough, you know, that was seen as a great boon to free expression. You know, those yeah. barriers, having to get the New York Times op-ed editor to green light your piece uh, or get a publishing contract, you know, there, there was another route and, you know, that was celebrated and it has an, enabled an enormous amount of expression, but now we face not just with social media, but with AI and large language models, you know, the very nature of these services is that immediacy, is the fact that there's no intermediary, there's no editor that you send it to. They, these posts are not reviewed before they, uh, you know, make it out into the world. You know, with chat GPT, it's automated. You know, you could never execute on that in any other way. And so I guess, you know, what do you think about that balance? Do you think there's still something to that idea that the accessibility of these platforms uh, and, and the reach that you can attain is a positive that as a society we need to try yeah. to preserve or has it tipped over? And so that it's really more negative than positive at this point and, you know, we ought to try to rein them in and make them look more like book or magazine publishing. You know, I think both things are true. I think it is true that, that things like Twitter have value. You know, for, for example, with a rapidly breaking news story, you very often find out what's happening faster uh, on something like Twitter than you do from any other source. Also, in uh, various moments of political upheaval, such as I'm thinking of, for example, the Arab Spring, um, the, the, the use of Twitter was incredibly important to the demonstrators um, in, in, um, in that moment and, and got the news out to the rest of us in the world about what they were trying to do and what they stood for and et cetera. Um, so there's no question that there is value. You know, the, 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 the question is how that can be protected from drowning in a kind of sea of vitriol and lies. Um, and this is the question that we face, because I think it's a question that has enormous democratic consequences. And um, I wish I knew the answer, but at least I can ask the question. I want to ask you a little bit about institutions and, you know, both how you see these threats to free speech affecting our democratic institutions, elections, the functioning of a body like the United States Congress, uh, the role of the executive branch and a presidency kind of amid these buffeting tensions and the, the erosion of truth. You know, what, what is at stake and how can we fortify our institutions? You know, sometimes I get frustrated because the conversation about democracy often doesn't even seem to reference free speech. It's all about, you know, free and fair elections. And of course, that's incredibly important and voting rights and yet, Free speech is an underpinning that I feel is almost sort of being lost in this uh, mortal debate over how we save our democracy. Yeah, well, it is a mortal debate. And, and I think one of the problems is that you have essentially only one major political party that seems to believe in democratic values now. And you, and you have another one that seems to be doing everything it can to undermine them. Um, when you have the large majority of Republican voters believing that the last election was stolen, uh, as they do every time they're asked, it's very large majority of Republican voters believe that Donald Trump won the last election um, and that he was cheated of his victory. Now, if the assault on the truth has reached that level of success, then we're in real trouble. And, and I mean, I've always believed, and I think just about I still believe, that the answer to speech is more speech, that the, the answer to wrong speech is better speech. And I do think that that's what we have to get better at doing. You know, we have to get better at combating uh, this, this tidal wave of misinformation, disinformation, um, by telling the truth, you know. And, I mean, when we had our pen meeting at the United Nations, uh, one of the things that I was trying to say there 
was that what's happening actually is a very, is is a is quite a literary thing. It's a battle of narratives. You know, that that you have all over the world false narratives being propounded quite cold-bloodedly um, in order to make possible certain kinds of actions uh, in, the, in the present moment. And make America great again has always made me want to ask, when exactly was that? <laughs> what was the date uh, uh, to which we are looking backwards? Was it, for example, when there was slavery? Was it before women had the vote? Was it before the civil rights movement? You know, exactly which is the, Ameri the American greatness to which we must return? Because of course, it's just simply, it's a golden age myth. Um, and the thing about the golden age is that it never existed. And, and the myth of the golden age is always used to justify actions in the present. Um, in England, the Brexit catastrophe was the result of another golden age myth which is that you know, England used to be this glorious country and it would, could be that glorious country again if only we could get rid of all these foreigners. And that didn't work very well because of course they neglected to mention to their population, their electorate, that the reason England was so prosperous was that it had spent 200 years plundering the rest of the world. Um, in India now, there's a golden age myth which is that India was a wonderful place before the Muslims arrived. Uh, and that if it could go back to be to those, that purely Hindu nation, everything would be better. This allows all kinds of sectarian violence to be taking place in the present day. So wherever you look, you see narratives being pushed, which are dangerous narratives. And, and we are the keepers of narrative. You know, it's our job, journalists and writers, and we have to just become a whole lot better at providing counter narratives. We have to wrap in a minute, but I, I want to push you a little bit on that and ask, you know, what, what does it actually look like to construct and promulgate a narrative that can you know, I, I take your point about the golden age, but I also think about how we began this conversation. You're saying that you came here in part because of the First Amendment. And, you know, the, this, yes. this hall and this uh, museum is about the Constitution. And I think we're all here in part because we actually do believe there's something valuable. Maybe there was no perfect moment, but there were some ideas and then some institutions that work better than just about any alternative that you could ma imagine when they were working at their best. So how do we, as we look forward, you know, what is the narrative that we can construct about the future that has some hope of getting people beyond, you know, what you've called me, uh, you said, described to me as, as, as people being defined by what, that which offends them. What is the mm -hmm. affirmative narrative or, you know, where should we look, where do we grope to begin to construct that? I don't know, it's very hard to get people to celebrate the positive, much easier to get them to denigrate what they think of as negative. It's an unfortunate, unfortunate characteristic of human nature that's, that it's easier to attack than to defend. And if what we're trying to do is defend values, which you rightly say, I'm sure everybody in, assembled in that, in that room believes in, um, uh, all you can do is do it, you know, and you, what you have to do is win the arguments. And, and that means having people who are good at arguing. And to do that, it's not going to be overnight. It might be a generational thing. And, and, um, and you have to persuade young people that it's worth it. I mean, that, that's, that's, it seems to me the danger to me is young people ceasing to believe in First Amendment values and preferring the idea that all sorts of speech should be prevented because they don't like it or it, rep or it represents values which they don't hold. Um, but the whole point, I mean, I've said this to any number of student audiences and they always look a little bewildered, that the defense of free speech begins when somebody says something you don't like. 
that it's, it's, it's perfectly easy to defend speech with which you agree or which, or, 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 or which seems to you to be irrelevant. The defense, you, when you discover if you're in favor of free speech is precisely when somebody says something you don't like and the more extremely you don't like it, the more, the more it questions whether you believe in free speech or not. So free speech is the defense of speech you don't like. And, and we have to persuade people of that in, in this age of offendedness, you know, this age of um, outrage identity. Uh, that has to come to an end. Uh, it's too easy to define yourself by what outrages you. It, it's necessary for us to understand that you have to allow the, the speech of those you don't like. Well, Salman, uh, you, know, you embody the courage to say that which uh, others may not like uh, and to hold your ground come what may and no matter what. And so your courage is inspiring and your charge to all of us to turn around this narrative uh, is potent. So thank you so much for joining us uh, here today uh, and being with us. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to have been able to do it. Thank you very much. Friends, at the end of his extraordinary conversation with Suzanne Nossel, Salman Rushdie challenged us to defend the First Amendment principle that we must protect the thought we hate, as Justice Holmes called it, and that in America, speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That's the principle that comes from the Brandenburg case. It was articulated by Brandeis in Whitney, and it makes America, as Salman Rushdie said, the most speech-protective country in the world. And on our first panel, we're going to explore the history of that shining idea with three of America's greatest historians of freedom of speech, and I'm so excited for the conversation. Uh, we have Jacob Machangama from the Future of Free Speech Project, Akilah Mar from Yale Law School, Steve Solomon from NYU, and uh, Jacob, Meshengam, I want to jump right in and first say that your book, uh, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, I think is the clearest and best history of the evolution of the idea that I've read. And I want to begin by asking you, where did it come from? The phrase that we must have the freedom to speak as we will and think as we speak, you teach, came from Tacitus, the Roman historian, and it was then picked up by Spinoza, I learned from your book, and then articulated by Cato's letters, the great Whig revolutionary theorists who inspired Jefferson. Tell us more about that evolution, how it began in Athens and Rome, and then was picked up by the Enlightenment. Well, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me to you. I, I'm not an American, uh, so I feel like I've been given a, a wild card to the all-star First Amendment uh, game here in the US. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, yeah, uh, the First Amendment was not the, the first invention of, of free speech. I, I would say we need to go back to the Athenian democracy, actually, uh, to find the origins of free speech. And the Athenians had two models of free speech. One was um, isagoria, meaning equality of political speech. All freeborn male citizens had a right to speak. And then parousia, which is a, a civic commitment to the tolerance of dissent, which permeated Athenian culture. And then you have the interesting Roman example uh, of Tacitus, but the Roman example is a bit more top-down elitist conception of free speech. So it was the elite, the well-educated elite, not the, the unwashed mob uh, who was supposed to exercise uh, free speech. But it was the Roman ideals that inspired, as you, as you mentioned, um, Cato's letters that, that came up with this great enlightenment meme that free speech is the great bulwark of liberty that made it into the Virginia Declaration, which made it into Madison's first draft of the, of the First Amendment, which even made it to radicals in, in, in Russia and was, was spread all over uh, colonial America, and which also, I think, played 
a very important role in a, in a, in a case from 1735, the Sanger case, where a, a printer who was the printer of the first opposition newspaper in, in the US was attacking the governor of New York, was, was put on trial for seditious libel. And normally it would have been an open and shut case, but the jury, uh, drunk on Cato's principles, um, was uh, decided to acquit him, uh, even though the common law was, was, was pretty clear. And since, then, since that case, it basically became almost impossible for colonial governors to, to use seditious libel trials uh, to, to convict people, to have juries convict them, because a culture of free speech had been inculcated. And I think that marks a huge difference from, from 17th century America, where you have more than 1,200 cases of people being prosecuted for speech, where here in Pennsylvania, uh, under William Penn, himself a former prisoner of conscience, you had pre-publication censorship and a council in 1683 presided over by William Penn uh, sentenced and Anthony Weston to be lashed 30 times for you know, sedition speaking out against the government that, that William Penn presided over. So a huge shift between the 17th and the 18th century in the, in the understanding of the importance of free speech and that sort of plays into developments leading up to the revolution and also afterwards. Oh, what a beautiful encapsulation of the history of free speech. That phrase, drunk on Cato's letters, just sums up how the colonist absorbed the spirit of liberty, and you, and you so well set the stage for our conversation. Akhil Amar, you uh, were my first uh, teacher of constitutional law and have kindled my understanding of the Constitution and that of so many Americans. And in his Virginia Bill for Religious Freedom, Thomas Jefferson offered four reasons for protecting free speech. First, that freedom of speech is an unalienable natural right that comes from God or nature, not government. Second, that free speech is necessary for the discovery and spread of political truth. Third, that free speech is necessary to hold public officials to account. And fourth, that it's necessary for democratic self-government. Now, not all of those were shared by the, all of the founders, and you've taught in your writings that it was really a concern about the collective uh, self-determination of the people that was at the centerpiece of so many of the founders, and that that evolved over the course of American history. But I want you to teach our friends um, how those Jeffersonian ideals were accepted or not by the different founders, and who were the leading voices in the founding on behalf of free speech? So Jeff, it's such a great honor to be back here. And yeah, you're right, way back when, you know, when I had black hair, um, and you were just a lad, that's when we first <laughs> met. And, um, uh, and this is an amazing audience, but Salman Rushdie said one thing at the end that should you know, concern us all. Look, look around, there are not enough young people in the room. We were young back then. We have to, we have to teach our children to, you know, to, to borrow from Crosby Sills, um, uh, <coughs> Nash and Young. So here's the thing, because Jeff, you're right. This is an amazing place. Ladies and gentlemen, please look to your right, OK? So, that is the room where it happened, and two things happened, and they were different. You know, people can talk, but then are you willing to walk the walk? Okay, the Declaration of Independence, drafted there, and here's the thing, wasn't really put to a vote. And then the Constitution is drafted there, and it is put to a vote, and the Athenians didn't put the Clisthenic Constitution to a vote, and the Romans didn't, and this is astonishing, and that's amazing, and more people got to vote on when America became great. It's not perfect slavery and all the rest, but that's a moment in human history. Of, it's astonishing because an entire freaking continent is getting to vote on how they and their posterity are going to be governed. More people got to vote than ever before in human history, but they also spoke. So in you actually have here an artifact, a newspaper publishing the proposed constitution, there is freedom of the press before there's a First Amendment, you see, because the press is free to publish this short little thing. It's short, not so judges can make stuff up, um, but so that ordinary people can actually read it start to finish and decide whether they're for it or against it. So that's freedom of the press before there's a First Amendment. They put it to a vote, two things, and then I'll shut up. The first thing ordinary people say is, like, dudes, you forgot the rights 
To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, securing their just powers from the extent of the government. You forgot the rights, says George Mason and other people, and they did. And in this ratification process, actually, the federal said, you're right, we goofed. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to add some amendments. And what do the amendments say? The people, the people, the people, the people, the people. As in the right of the people to petition and assemble, and the second amendment, and the fourth, and the ninth, and tenth, because it's coming from this we the people act of ordainment and establishment. We're putting it to a vote, and ordinary people say, you know, we want rights, including rights to criticize, because that's what we're doing right now. Final point, the people who you're allowed to oppose the Constitution and you're not voted off the island. If you oppose the Declaration of Independence, you're almost not heard from again, truth be told, because it's a war. And you're either for us or against us, and almost no one who opposes the Declaration goes on to anything, truthfully. You can oppose the Constitution, um, and like George Mason, we still have universities named after you, you see? And you can be President of the United States, James Monroe, Vice President of the United States, Elbridge Gerry, um, uh, George Clinton, Justice on the Supreme Court, Samuel Chase. So we don't just say it, we do it. The Bill of Rights comes from critics, comes from dissenters, comes from bottom up from the people. So two amazing things happen there. Declaration, not bad. Constitution, even better, because more people got to vote, got to speak, got to criticize, and they were listened to and not voted off the island. And that's the story of the word, the people, um, in this amazing wall that you have up there. Beautiful. And you tell the story of the connection between we the people and the Constitution so well in your books. And Akhil, I just have to tell you what an electric thrill it is to be talking about the First Amendment here with you and our friends gazing at the Independence Hall. It's just an extraordinarily sacred space to be talking about free speech. Steve Solomon, the man who convened all of us, your magnificent book, uh, Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founders Generation Created the Freedom of Speech, tells the stories of jury trials like the Zenger trial, which Jacob Machangama mentioned, and other dissenters like McDougall, who uh, were uh, acquitted by jury nullification by liberty-loving juries that didn't want to enforce seditious libel laws. Tell us about how those revolutionary dissenters shaped the founders' conception yeah. of free speech. Well, thank, thank you, Jeff, very much. So the law that was uh, of England, the common law of England that was adopted here, it came over the Atlantic, um, defined freedom of speech in a very limited way. What it, what it said was it was the freedom from prior restraints. So the government could not shut down the newspaper, it could not license a newspaper. However, once you published, <laughs> you were responsible for what you published. And in terms of what we're talking about today, the concern was criticism of the government. And that's what we call seditious libel. It's the criminalization of criticism of the government. That system was here. Now, in August of 1765, after the passage of the Stamp Act, which taxed Americans without their consent, something happened in Boston. They put up, they, they dedicated a liberty tree. And half the town came up, came out, and they heard speeches all day. There were effigies hanging of the British Prime Minister, and it energized the opposition. This was carried by newspapers all throughout the colonies, and one by one, um, all these cities put up their own liberty poles, liberty trees, and debate was energized, and it was opposition to British taxes without consent, and other things too, like general warrants. And the liberty trees were just one thing. People started writing pamphlets, broadsides, <clears throat> they, they wrote poems, they wrote plays. They were all criticizing Britain for their policies. Now, at least technically, all, all of this literature, all this action was, was a violation of seditious libel. Jacob made mention of, of the Zenger case, that was 1735. Now go forward to the 1760s, 
the British aren't really happy about all this criticism, and they start to, to try to use their seditious libel laws against the colonists. But they're not successful, because in order to bring a case, you've got to convince a grand jury to indict. They couldn't do that. Some examples. The Boston Gazette, the most radical paper in America, published you know, Samuel Adams. They published all kinds of revolutionary literature. The uh, governor tried four times to get indictments. All four times the grand jury said no. Then he went to the General Assembly of Massachusetts, tried to get action there. They came back and said no, and said the freedom of the press was a bulwark of liberty. He moved south to New York City. He mentioned Alexander McDougall. Alexander McDougall was a wealthy merchant. He, he circulated a broadside from the Sun of Liberty. He was identified as, as, the, uh, as the writer. Um, they were unable to, to convict him, again, because of the popular resistance to seditious libel. And I have one, one more example, because it shows just how desperate the colonial governors were, the royal governors. Go down, again, a little bit south to Virginia, Governor Dunmore, 1775, conflict has already broken out at Lexington and Concord. He flees Williamsburg, gets on a man of war, British man of war in Chesapeake Bay, and he's, he's still criticized, he's suffering the slings of, and arrows of outrageous pamphlets, <laughs> and he's very unhappy. He's, he's like, well, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to indict these, these, these newspaper publishers, but he has another idea. One morning, he sends a dozen of his soldiers on a boat off the man of war into, into Norfolk, and they go to the, to the offices of the Norfolk intelligencer, and they take the printing press, and they take it out to the man of war. Not only do they shut down the Norfolk paper, very critical of him, but then they start publishing all kinds of propaganda in favor of the, of the king. So that's the desperation that they had. How could they stop the criticism? It got to the point where the only way to stop it was to take this kind of radical action. Now, there's, uh, coming out of this period, I, I, I have to quote Samuel Adams, who I think was, you know, maybe said it best. Listen to this quote. There is nothing so terrible to tyrants as a free press. There's nothing so terrible to tyrants as a free press. You can see that today, right? I mean, Salman talked about authoritarianism. That's what authoritarians do. They try to shut down the press. He saw that, and that's where we are. Uh, Steve, you just talked about the history of sedition. And Jacob, I want to ask you about the history of sedition. So as Steve and Akhil mentioned, the Sedition Acts of 1798 tried to criminalize any uh, criticism of the Federalist President, John Adams, but not the Republican Vice President, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Madison objected to the Sedition Acts uh, on grounds of federalism. They said that uh, c Congress couldn't exercise that power, reserving the possibility that the states might. But in their great dissents in the 1920s, Brandeis and Holmes disagreed and came up with the idea that speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. And merely causing offense against the authorities was not enough. So I want to ask you, what's the history of that principle, that you can only restrict speech if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? Was it uh, original with Holmes and Brandeis, or are there roots back in ancient times. Well, I, I want to take a step back first with the Sedition Act of, of 1798 because I think that really demonstrates that the sort of two conceptions of egalitarian and elitist free speech survived into to American history. So you see that suddenly with the Sedition Act, suddenly federalists are saying, well, the first, yes, we've adopted the First Amendment, but basically we have a Blackstonian conception of free speech, you know, prior constraints, but if you say something against the government, you know, you can, you can go to jail. Whereas as, as Madison, at least, you know, if you read his report of, of 1800, 
he, he writes a meticulous, argue, uh, detailed argument in, in favor of why the First Amendment protects against seditious libel, and he specifically distinguishes America from Britain, where Britain has a, a much more elitist system. Uh, America uh, is uh, governed by the people, and therefore, you know, seditious libel laws uh, violate that. So, so that's, that, that, that's important. I think those two conceptions are with us today. Even in the age of social media, we see sort of uh, these two uh, conceptions. But the idea that, um, you know, that words should only be uh, punishable when they, um, when they incite to violence, or at least when they, uh, you know, lead to acts is something that you see in Tacitus. Mm. It's something that you see uh, in, Sp in, in, in Spinoza. Mm. And of course, they are uh, crystallized uh, very clearly in, in Brandenburg, uh, which uh, is a, a decision which I think a lot of people outside America don't understand, uh, including in my country. My ho country, ho home country, Denmark, is right now reintroducing a blasphemy ban uh, because of people on the far right have been burning Qurans in, uh, in, in public. So now the, the government is passing a law which says that the improper treatment of religious objects um, will be punishable with prison of up to two years under a chapter in our criminal law which punishes treason and threats to national security. And you know, it was only in 2017 that the Danish government uh, abolished it, its, its blasphemy ban. So I think that principle really is central to the principle that Salman also talked about, that if you are serious about defending speech for those that you don't like, you really need to have very, very clear principle, because otherwise human beings are experts at convincing themselves, coming up with elaborate narratives of why free speech is really important, but the communists, the abolitionists, the women's rights activists, the gay rights activists are actually undermining free speech or undermining the, the, the values on which you know, democracy depends and therefore they have to be uh, criminalized. So I, th so I personally am a big fan of, 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 of Brandenburg uh, and I wish <laughs> that principle was more universally observed, but that's not the world we live in. Yes, we must teach that Brandenburg principle as part of our convening today. Speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Not if it might cause a possible bad act in the future, not if it might cause offense, not if it could possibly incite people to affiliate with others who might argue. No, it has to be intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. And it's the most speech protective principle in the world and so interesting to learn that it has roots in Tacitus and Spinoza. Akil, help us understand um, exactly where it came from in the thoughts of the founders. Jacob mentioned Madison's report of 1800. Is that the crystallization of the libertarian conception that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence? And then how did it evolve during the Civil War and finally make its way to, Brand to Brandeis and Holmes and Brandenburg? Yeah, thanks for mentioning the Civil War because it's important. Um, so here's... <laughs> No I, I, I actually, <laughs> this was not intentional. I get all my clothes from uh, downstairs, you know, my ties and things like that. But it turns out, I, I think I'm wearing my Abraham Lincoln socks today. <laughs> I, that wasn't, you know, for this event, but it, um, so, um, and I do have my We the People socks from downstairs. They're very nice and, and all, they have great ties here. Here's the point. Salman Rushdie told you, because he's you know, one of the world's greatest writers about storytelling and narrative. Okay. Narratives are very powerful. Here's why we have a particular challenge. Because we're the one nation in the world where the great-grandchildren of all the other continents actually come together. And that puts real cha um, strains on us because we don't have race in common. We don't have religion in common, not even quite language. Some of our forebears came here hundreds of years ago in chains. Others hundreds of years ago with bull whips in their hands, and others came yesterday. So the only thing that we have in common is actually our constitution and our narrative. And the big narrative, Brandenburg is good and Brandeis is good and all the rest, but here's the big narrative. You need to understand the American Revolution, which gives us the Declaration of the Constitution, and the American Civil War, which gives us the 14th Amendment. That's big picture, that's what we Americans have in common. We have in common George Washington, 
uh, and Abe Lincoln especially, more than anyone else. So, he told you, and he's right, the Brits, they're so stupid, they actually, it's not just that they put a tax, you know, the Americans haven't voted for, they put a tax on paper in the Stamp Act. That's a tax on newspapers, and who's not going to like that? The newspapers, okay? <laughs> Don't put a tax on newspapers, because they're going to push back. That's not very smart, and that's the American Revolution, you see. And there's anxiety about this new central government that's being created. And so the first thing they said, where's the rights? And the central government, you see, can't restrict stuff. Congress shall make no law. And John Adams you know, wasn't quite there for all of this. He, um, and he kind of missed the memo. And so he makes it a crime to criticize Donald Trump, I mean, to criticize um, John Adams, excuse me. Um, and, um, uh, and he's thrown out on his ass by the American people. He's the only early president who is, okay? Because he doesn't get it. But today, threats come not just from um, religious extremism, as Salman Rushdie said, and maybe not just from certain media outlets that have monopolies, um, but from state and local governments. Think about, actually, the threats today. And this one isn't going to help you very much. It says, Congress shall make no law. Well, there's another war in America. Because the Revolutionary War are locals against the central government. And we like local juries and local militias even. And that's our Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law in the 10th Amendment. And militias and juries in the 5th Amendment grand jury, 6th Amendment trial jury, 7th Amendment civil jury. That's Steve's story. It's about revolutionary dissent. But the rights actually originally don't apply against states and localities. And that's a mistake, because states and localities start to suppress, and Jefferson doesn't fully get it. And it's a, it's a capital offense in many states to criticize slavery. I'm not making that up. A, a capital offense. The Republican Party is outlawed in the Deep South in the 1850s more than the Communist Party ever was in the 1950s. Abraham Lincoln's name is not allowed to be on the ballot in effect, south of Virginia gets a zero popular, not electoral, zero, zero. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Zero popular votes south of Virginia because we've outlawed discourse. And a great war comes as a result of this. And, and in the aftermath, we insist never again, no state can make or enforce any law which abridges these fundamental rights shall make no law abridged. That's there, but that's limiting the federal government. Now, the 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge, shall make no law abridged. The same words as you see up there, but states and localities are limited. That's because of Lincoln. That's because of the Civil War. So final sentence, the only thing we have in common is our Constitution and our national narrative. And our kids don't learn it. They don't know their presidents. They don't know the history of the Revolution and the Civil War, which give us the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment. And if we don't know that, we die. OK? So, so that's our narrative. And we need great storytellers to tell that story. And when they come here, they begin to learn that story, Jeff. Um, but we have to bring the children here. We really do. That's the national narrative that needs to be taught. Absolutely, Akil, and it's so exciting to think of bringing all those school kids to stand in this space, to see the tablet, and then to see that gallery, and to see uh, Brandeis' original opinion, and George Washington's letter to the uh, Quakers, and Mary Beth Tinker's armband, and it's, it's just a, a, a privilege to be able to inspire the next generation. Steve Solomon, as, as Akil and, and Jacob have said, um, many of the founders were not especially committed to a libertarian conception of freedom of speech. Jefferson was more concerned about keeping the federal government out of prosecuting sedition, but he himself authorized state sedition prosecutions. Hamilton uh, would have allowed prosecution of uh, laws with bad tendency after the facts. Did any of those juries that acquitted um, accused critics of the government in the colonial era articulate the idea that speech was a natural right that should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence, or was that really just crystallized later? 
the juries themselves did not articulate that because that's not what juries do. They come back with guilty and not guilty. Grand juries either indict or don't indict, so they don't come out with a, necessarily with reasons for it. But the founders did. So in, the, in, the, in their papers, in their essays, in their, um, their pamphlets, and there were so many of them, they articulated, they went back to the Enlightenment philosophers, John Locke, natural rights. And um, they also worked from the bills of rights that the states had passed, which nine of the 11 bills of rights included the right to a free press. And they called it, it wasn't just the right to a free press, it was, they called it the bulwark of liberty. Now, I think that gives us some clues because if it was just one of a lot of other rights, they would just say freedom of the press. What they saw was the press as a bulwark of liberty, meaning that you can't protect all the other rights if you don't have a free press. And so they were also concerned about general warrants. They were concerned about their jury, uh, the rights to a jury trial being taken away. Without the right to protest, without the right to protest, you can't protect the other rights. You're silenced, and so you lose the other rights by not being able to stand up to them. And so there are clues. There was no committee that sat down and said, here's what we mean by freedom of speech and freedom of the press. There's no committee, but I think what you try to do is, is draw from the writings and their actions, and what did they actually understand the concept to mean? And you take that from all the debates that went on, uh, it's especially in the ratification period. Almost, I, I would say probably all of the ratification um, conventions involved a lot of talk about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So, um, yeah. Uh, speech is the bulwark of every other right is so important to remember. We just have time for one final round of, of concluding thoughts. Salman Rushdie challenged us to debate the idea that the American principle that free speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence is more persuasive, more worthy of respect, better than the view embraced by all other Western democracies uh, in, in Europe and around the world uh, that speech can be banned if it offends dignity uh, and uh, if it uh, offends honor. Jacob Machangama, tell us about the competing European view. It, it has its roots in earliest European history. It was crystallized in the French Revolution. It was embraced in Weimar Germany and is rampant in Europe today so that our audience understands how different it is from the American view. Yeah, so the classic example would be so-called hate speech law. So every European democracy have laws that, for instance, criminalize um, making hateful uh, statements about specific groups, whether based on race or ethnicity uh, or religion. And if you want to steel man the case for that, well, then it, the argument goes, well, uh, the Nazis came into power through democratic means, and therefore, uh, democracies have to be intolerant of uh, intolerance uh, because otherwise totalitarian movements will abuse democracy and free speech to abolish uh, democracy itself. Uh, and you could say that, well, you know, to those of us who are more persuaded by the American approach, you could say, well, European democracies since World War II have been prosperous, stable, you have uh, robust political debate, and so What's, what's the danger? Yes, there might be, sometimes someone might be imprisoned or fined for speech that we would consider that should be protected. But all in all, you know, things ha have gone well. But, I, you know, my counter argument is what I call the Weimar fallacy. So the idea that Weimar Germany is an argument in favor of restricting free speech, I think, rests on pretty shaky historical grounds because the short lived Weimar democracy between 1918 and 1933, actually banned a lot of speech, including those of Nazis. Um, and, um, and ultimately, the, the most dangerous thing about it was that the Nazis were able to rely on the emergency laws that were supposed to protect democracy, to abolish democracy. So the emergency con uh, provision in the Weimar Constitution uh, allowed the president to 
uh, suspend all civil liberties. And what happened after the, 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 um, the, the fire in the Reichstag was that Hitler leaned on President Hindenburg to suspend all liberties. And that paved the way to give legal backing to basically the establishment of a totalitarian one-party state uh, that was entrenched within six months. Um, so, so I think historically that's, that's not a, a great argument. Of course, I can understand, you know, if I was the chancellor of Germany, could I go out tomorrow and sign a law saying, yes, now Holocaust denial is protected speech and Nazis can walk in the streets? That's not feasible from a, from a German uh, point of view. Uh, just like morally, historically, you couldn't do it. So I could understand why the Germans would not do it, but I, 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 I just don't think the historical arguments uh, are strong for that approach, which is why I uh, prefer the American one. But I also want to say that free, spe free speech is a, it's a continuous experiment, right? There's no, there's no guarantee that free speech will always uh, ensure tolerance and, and peace and, and prosperity. I, I, I think that his, historically, you know, the case for, for free speech is pretty good, but there's no guarantee that it, that will always be the case going forward. But I, if I was to sort of bet, I would bet on free speech over censorship <laughs> going forward. Uh, Keel, in just a, just a few sentences, because we're, we're uh, almost out of time, you are, you've described yourself as an American exceptionalist when it comes to free speech. Uh, tell our friends why you believe that the American approach to free speech is better than all other approaches? Well, at our best, we've produced um, a Lincoln, um, and I don't think any other country has. Um, um, my parents came from India here, and those of us who are here don't want to go to India. Um, so, um, uh, now, what I do want to say is there, there are threats posed by the government, by Congress, we talked about that, by states and localities, we talked about that, but some of the deepest threats are within ourselves because I think there's not just a freedom of speech, there's a duty to listen. Um, and it's, you can't easily enforce that, but we have obligations to try to listen to our fellow citizens and we're failing in that. And Nadine, my friend Nadine is nodding her head, and I was going to give her a shout out anyway, but she is nodding her head because she embodies this. It's so hard every day for me to actually read all the major networks, but I do. It's my kind of obligation as a citizen to try to hear folks across the world. No law can enforce this. This has to come from within, but if we stop talking to each other, and, and again, this is the spirit of these, um, amend th these amendments and these rules apply only against the government, okay? But the culture of freedom of speech, it's an amazing newspaper culture in America and people are actually reading opposing newspapers and we're not doing that so much anymore. But at our best we have, and we did produce, and yes, there was a civil war afterward and that should be sobering to us, but I would say, you know, if you are an American exceptionist, we put the thing to a vote, not 1776, but 1787. We didn't throw the critics off the island. We listened to them. Um, and then we allowed repression again. Um, but we, we elected a Lincoln who very much actually, uh, who wins because of debates, open debates. They're called the Lincoln-Douglas debates, covered in newspapers, and people are hearing both sides and then voting. That's how actually we did it at our best. That was more than a few sentences. My apologies. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Steve Solomon, the last word in this great discussion is to you. You convened us for this National First Amendment Summit. What is the one thing about the First Amendment that you want our audience to think about as we conclude this panel? Yes, so I would ask you very conveniently that the First Amendment is up there. Let's, let's look at it and see how it's laid out because I think this is a narrative of democracy and, and representative government. These are 45 words that are critical. So it starts with two religion clauses which ask people, protect people when they, in their inner self, the freedom of thought, the freedom of conscience, and they 
they think about sort of their place in, univer in the universe and perhaps their relationship to a higher power. That's the, that's the inner self. Look at the next right. We emerge from our, from our inner self and we are protected in the freedom of speech whereby we are talking about ideas and political ideas and some of them may be very controversial. That's all well and good, but it doesn't do much politically unless you can get it out to a lot of people. And so the next right the founders protected is freedom of the press, the institutional means of spreading ideas that people have among themselves. Now, once you do that, you spread these ideas across the country, the next step that's protected is you, get a lo you, you assemble with like-minded people for political purposes. And that's you know, in the streets, around, and back then it was back in Liberty Trees and so forth. And so you bring together a political movement. For what purpose? To petition the government for a redress of grievances. And that's the final right. So it's not just a bunch of rights that are kind of put together, but there's a narrative of democracy from the beginning to actual political change. And the speech and press sit there right in the middle and are absolutely critical to that process. Beautiful. For having educated us about the five freedoms of the First Amendment, please thank our panelists and please welcome our next panelists. As they come up, we are so honored to have Bruce Brown from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and he will be moderating our conversation with Jamil Jaffer, Larissa Lidsky, and the great Floyd Abrams. Enjoy the conversation. Oh, what a nice, nice chair. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I um, confess that I feel that I was showed up by Akhil Amar with his Lincoln socks. The, 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 uh, uh, the Reporters Committee has socks, too. Um, but I'm still a little bit stiff uh, in public, and I just can't bring myself to wear them yet. But um, they're on the website if you want to go check them out. Uh, it's a way to walk the First Amendment walk. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here with Jamil Floyd uh, and Larissa, and we're going to get right to it. Uh, because we have a lot to cover. The last few months have been just a dizzying time uh, uh, in, uh, for First Amendment watchers. So many different headlines and cases um, spitting out there. A newspaper raid in Kansas. A lawsuit in Florida brought by Disney against Governor DeSantis. A defamation case against Fox News that fizzles out into um, a, f a very large financial settlement for the company. Uh, Texas pulls TikTok off of state devices and networks. And then Montana decides, well, let's just ban TikTok entirely. Uh, two very closely watched cases involving social media moderation, one in Texas, one in Florida, and finally now the Biden administration has weighed in. And then just last Friday, two more developments. Uh, a federal appeals court in the Fifth Circuit um, weighs in in a very interesting jawboning case about uh, government contacts with social media platforms around content they carry uh, and whether they cross the line. And then a case we'll, we'll hear Floyd talk about uh, where his law firm uh, representing Twitter um, we can still call it Twitter, right, in Philadelphia. We still call them the Philadelphia A's, right? So I think we can still say Twitter. Uh, uh, Twitter sues the state of California over its uh, moderation law. Um, looking at this vast array of cases, uh, I'd like to go to each one of you um, to see where you view 
areas of defense. You know, where, where do we as press advocates have to be playing defense? And then where, where are the opportunities? You know, where we as press lawyers often gripe that the Supreme Court hasn't heard a libel case in 30 years and it's been, you know, 20 plus years since there's been any media case, that there is a lot going on out there nonetheless. Where are the opportunities? Jamil, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, well, okay, so first let me say th thanks for the invitation to, to be here. Thanks to Jeff and the National Constitution Center and everybody uh, who's involved in putting this together. Um, great to have such a big crowd, too. Um, I guess when I, when I think about you know, what the dangers are and what the opportunities are, um, I mean, I'm definitely worried about the erosion of particular doctrines. Like, for example, the, the, the right to speak anonymously, uh, I think is a hugely significant, important First Amendment right uh, that is uh, under a lot of pressure right now. Um, and I, I worry about that. Uh, but to be honest, I actually think that uh, I spend more time worried about not the erosion of First Amendment doctrine, but rather the calcification of First Amendment doctrine. Um, you know, it goes without saying that we live in this era of incredible technological change, and the information ecosystem that we live in now is totally different um, from the one that existed even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I think it's really important that we hold fast to First Amendment values, to the values that the First Amendment was meant to protect, like accountability uh, and tolerance and uh, autonomy, um, uh, truth-seeking and self-government. Like These are really important values, at least as important now as they were when the First Amendment was drafted. Um, but I think that First Amendment doctrine needs to be responsive to technological change. And um, now what we used to call the public square is almost entirely owned by private corporations. Um, uh, social media has democratized speech in a lot of ways, but it's also introduced a whole set of new pathologies. It's also true that surveillance technology, I think, has turned on its head the traditional relationship or the ideal relationship between the citizen and the government. Uh, and, and now I think it's increasingly fair to say that citizens are totally transparent to the government, not just to the government, but to powerful private actors as well. Uh, whereas those governments and powerful private actors are almost entirely opaque to us. Uh, and that's a complete reversal of the, uh, the appropriate democratic relationship. Um, I think the First Amendment has to be responsive uh, to all of that. And I worry when uh, I see um, other First Amendment advocates and First Amendment litigators uh, defending First Amendment doctrine as if it were the, do it, 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 the doctrine were an end in itself. You know, that doctrine exists to protect a set of values. Uh, and I don't, think, um, uh, I don't think we should lose sight of that set of values. Uh, that's what I, you know, if, I, if, I, if I'm up at night worrying about the First Amendment, I suppose that's probably the thing I'm worrying about. And, and Floyd, turning to you, we're looking at this vast array of, of headlines out there in our area, where do you see the opportunities to make, to make new law, and where do you worry about erosion? Yeah, I'm not looking for a lot of new law about the First Amendment. Uh, I think the direction we should be most focused on, or at least I think the courts should be most focused on, is preserving old law, uh, not necessarily very old law, uh, but applying principles which have made us the, the most uh, free in terms of free speech, free press, in the history of the world, uh, and not, not moving away from there. Now, you can't escape new problems with new uh, technology uh, and the like. Uh, I think one of the most important issues <clears throat> that will surely be litigated 
and not in just a few years, now and in, well into the future, uh, does relate to social media, necessarily relates to the degree to which social media will have, or at least more or less have, the same level of First Amendment protection, which means absence of government control, um, as, as would otherwise be the case. I mean, social media is where a lot of, I, I know a lot of the action is uh, on the ground, but uh, in terms of First Amendment law, uh, I think we're gonna have major cases that you adverted to them in the Supreme Court sooner rather than later <clears throat> about you know, questions like uh, can states uh, uh, require social media entities to have a, a sort of what we used to call a fairness doctrine. Uh, you put on one side, you want to put the other. You must put the other side on. That has been held unconstitutional as regards to the print press. The Supreme Court has said unambiguously, and it's not really being challenged at all now, <clears throat> you can't tell a newspaper what to print, period. You think it's not fair that they're loaded in this direction or that direction? Too bad, read another newspaper. <laughs> Do something else. Uh, that, that really is a uh, 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 rather simplified comic book way, way to describe but it's not, it's not wrong. And it's a very important question <clears throat> about how social media will be treated uh, in the courts. Uh, I mean, in my view, they have a very strong argument that they should get the same or something like the same amount of protection for some of the same sorts of reasons for fear of government control or government oversight uh, but that is not necessarily uh, how the law is going to move. The Supreme Court has one case they'll probably just decide in the next year relating to the Florida uh, uh, and Texas uh, legislatures which have passed laws designed to assure what the legislators in those states thought was fair. And so in an absolutely critical moment <clears throat> in the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, uh, a judge uh, asked uh, the lawyer for what I'll call the company, the media, social media companies, are you saying that you could have up in, on the ground that you could favor the Democrats over the Republicans? And the answer was yes. The judge put that in the opinion of the Fifth Circuit, which I think is going to be reversed by the Supreme Court. But nonetheless, the court put that, thank you, uh, in, in the opinion uh, of, of the Fifth Circuit in a sort of, can you believe it? I mean, can you really believe that, that in response to that straightforward, flat question, the answer was, yes, you can do it. Now, no one now anymore, I think, thinks that the law is, certainly not is, or even plausibly is about to change so that a newspaper or a magazine or a book writer could be forced to answer the, the question, aren't you biased, aren't, aren't you leaning, leaning, you're, you're in their pockets. All you do is praise them and denounce them. That situation for now, and I believe into the future, is really clear, but we, we don't have a great idea mm -hmm. what the court is gonna say about social media on that. The other topic, the only other one I, mention, I would mention, <clears throat> is that we are likely to have more defamation cases which may, reach, which may reach the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, and there are at least three of the, the most conservative members of the court who have said in so many words <clears throat> that they would, well, the two plus one that we know, uh, that, that they want to set aside what may well be the greatest press victory in American history, 
which is the New York Times versus Sullivan case of 1964. As the court has become more conservative and as some members of, of the court have become uh, unambiguously anti-press, uh, it makes it all the more likely that that, that case uh, may well come up before uh, this court. Uh, and uh, while for what it's worth, I don't think they're going to reverse an effect or set aside New York Times against Sullivan. We don't know. Uh, it's in play. It's in play intellectually. It's in play juridically. And so uh, I think that's, I think they will take one of these cases, some very sympathetic case from the point of view you know, of someone who's really been wronged and because we protect speech so much, doesn't have a remedy. The only other thing I, I could say is that I really can't talk about the Twitter case okay. <laughs> because it has just been filed. Sure, understood, understood. Um, Larissa, I'd like you to engage on um, the, same, the same question, but add one more layer to it. You, you have devoted your life um, as an educator, uh, law school professor, and I think everybody w would be quite interested in hearing from your perspective as a law professor, what parts of the doctrine uh, are you struggling to persuade your students to accept today? You know, wh where do you see uh, the weaknesses uh, in their um, understanding and appreciation of, of First Amendment jurisprudence, and what thoughts do you have about what we can do about that in order to restore some of that belief? Yeah. So um, when, you're, when you're teaching law students, it's important to remember law students are just people uh, like the rest of us, and so they have some of the same um, uh, biases as the general public. And so one of the things I worry about generally is kind of the, the um, suspicion of the press, the suspicion that the press is, is, is not providing disinterested information in a way that uh, undermines support for press freedom generally and you know, increases support for things like overturning New York Times versus Sullivan, which gave a great deal of protection for the press to criticize government officials and to criticize what we might call today influencers, uh, as it was extended by the Supreme Court uh, but even more so, the biggest tension I see in students today is they see a big tension between liberty and equality. And so they are much more interested in punishing speech that might be thought to threaten equality. What they see is hate speech. They're much more interested as a, as a whole. These are gross generalizations. There's, you know, variations in students like the rest of, rest of us. But the younger generation sees emotional harm as a threat to their very safety in a way that might justify speech regulations. And you see this slide, right? Speech that's offensive becomes speech that makes me feel unsafe. And so the idea that we have to tolerate that speech as part of living in a democracy and the idea that we tolerate that speech because we don't know who's going to be in power the next iteration of elections, and we can't be sure that our side will be in power the next time, and what our side considers offensive you know, may not be the same thing that's considered offensive by the other side. And so that, that tension between equality and liberty comes out differently for a lot of students in the younger generation, and convincing them that their views may not win and that they need neutral principles um, to, to adopt so that you know, to ensure liberty for all of us um, is a harder sale than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And are there things you think we can do to help uh, buttress the belief in First Amendment, uh, the doctrine with this group? I think teaching, his, teaching civics is really important. I teach constitutional law as well as uh, First Amendment law and media law. So seeing the broad sweep of history and understanding that in the cycles of history, there's always an authoritarian impulse to silence that speech with which we disagree. And it always, when we look, up, look back on it, 
ends badly. It's never a good thing. And so history, I think, gives you humility, and it's the only way that these, these uh, Akil on the last panel talked about, indo not indoctrinating, but teaching students about the constitutional principles that bind us together, and the importance of holding our elected officials to norms that support those principles, uh, because we don't know that we'll always be the ones in power, and we need some common neutral principles that we can, that will bind us together despite our differences. Thank you. Um, keeping, very good, yeah, all right. And keeping with, with our teaching theme, I think it was Secretary Raimondo who said recently, Jamil, about the TikTok bans. Uh, if you want to lose every voter under 35, uh, yeah. go ban TikTok. Um, do you see an opportunity in, in these cases uh, for uh, an, an important opportunity to invigorate this generation with... Uh, the yeah, importance of absolutely. First Amendment protection. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that. Well, well, first, you know, one thing, uh, Larissa, I've heard, heard you say this before. Um, uh, I think it's really important that that uh, we teach the history of the civil rights movement in connection with free speech, because the, the the truth is, the civil rights movement in this country would never have got off the ground but for the freedom of speech. It was the First Amendment that protected that space. Um, and it's much harder to see free speech and equality in opposition once you understand a little bit about that, you know, about that history. But on the TikTok stuff, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are, um, uh, you know, college students, college age students who um, uh, care a lot about access to TikTok because TikTok is uh, a place where they. Um, themselves post content, they participate in a kind of conversation themselves, and they are listeners as well as speakers in that, uh, in that space. And there's a kind of, um, uh, kind of dismissiveness, I think, on the part of uh, some people who don't use uh, TikTok, mostly older people who don't use TikTok, and they think that TikTok is really just about dance videos or... Um, uh, and it's true, there are some very good dance videos on TikTok. But there is a lot more than that on TikTok, uh, including uh, political speech, speech about uh, every topic under the sun uh, is, on, is on TikTok and presented in uh, more ways than you can possibly imagine and in more communities than you can possibly imagine. Um, and a lot of that speech is really valuable, uh, society val uh, a societally val valuable speech, or socially valuable speech, um, uh, even if you think of dance videos as outside that, you know, outside that description. <laughs> um, and these college-age students now see political leaders proposing to, or even actually doing it, banning uh, the access to this platform. Um, and it is perhaps an introduction to um, uh, what free speech means in this country, what the First Amendment means in this country. Uh, I, as, as you know, Bruce, my organization, the Knight Institute, has challenged the constitutionality of Texas's TikTok ban uh, as applied to public university professors, because the effect of Texas's ban, uh, which reaches only state employees, uh, one effect of that ban is to prevent public university professors from accessing TikTok in the classroom, uh, or um, studying TikTok, uh, including studying, studying the, the uh, problems of disinformation and data collection on TikTok that are ostensibly the justification for the ban in the first place. So, um, uh, but I, I think that, uh, you know, Floyd, Floyd mentioned, I think, quite appropriately that we, we should be concerned about preserving uh, old First Amendment doctrine. One of the cases we're relying on in this case is a case called Lamont versus Postmaster General, uh, which is a 1964, I think, case uh, involving a statute that required people who wanted to receive communist propaganda from abroad to register with the post office uh, before they could receive it. And the Supreme Court struck down that uh, statute saying essentially, uh, unless the government has a very good reason uh, to prevent Americans from uh, accessing information from abroad, uh, it can't 
prevent them from doing it or burden their right to access that information. And the fact that the government regards this as propaganda is not a good reason. And one of the cases we rely on heavily in our uh, brief challenging the constitutionality of Texas's TikTok ban is, is, is that case. Um, and you know, one of the questions presented in this case is how to apply that principle uh, that was established in Lamont versus Postmaster General 50 years ago to this you know, very new and different, uh, different context. But I do think, to answer your, you know, your, mm -hmm. your question, um, that it's possible that some younger people who haven't yet had occasion to become familiar with the First Amendment or to fall in love with it uh, might become familiar with it and fall in love with it uh, because of uh, these threats to ban a platform that they care a lot about. So the famous phrase, they'll be dancing in the streets, <laughs> uttered after the Times decision, will take right. on new valence, That's right? True. After the, true, though, right, yeah. the dance videos we'll all mm -hmm. do on TikTok. Um, Floyd, this is a, a, just a perfect setting um, to ask you a question about the work you're now doing um, at Yale Law School uh, on the press clause. Uh, when you announced the project recently, you said, quote, for too long, the provision in the First Amendment that freedom of speech and of the press would be protected from government abridgment has led to justifiably broad protection of the former, but far too little notice of the latter. It is time to begin to address that constitutional deficiency. We're also eager to hear from you about what you are doing with this work and what you'd like to see come out of it. <clears throat> well, so far we're doing what uh, academics do. We're having conferences. <laughs> uh, 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 now, we, we are having a series of conferences around the country with great scholars, uh, which we've done for half a year now. We're doing for another year or so. Uh, hopefully, we're going to write something up which might, might persuade someone uh, on some quarter or other. Uh, I mean, we, we, we have, uh, amongst the problems we have, in the, in the country now about a free press is that small new newspapers are going out of business. Newspapers in areas which have been served sometimes only by one newspaper and which covers that town, that city, that part of that state uh, are not only not thriving, but, but are rapidly going uh, out of business. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that you know, a lawyer or academic can do about that. Uh, I asked <clears throat> uh, one editor of an Iowa newspaper with a circulation, I think, below 2,000. No, I, I said, I, speaking to you from a lawyer, to a journalist, what could we do? Suppose we asked you, what, what would you like? And he said, well, lower mail rates. Uh, I thought, well, <coughs> I can't help with that, you know. Um, the question is, <clears throat> is there something we can do in the law? Something that, that we can credibly and hopefully uh, persuasively argue that the First Amendment provides, uh, which could at least be of help when these organizations are up against Google uh, or other super large entities uh, which, with which they don't have good relations and would charge them a lot of money and things like, like that. Uh, but, but I don't have a good answer uh, to, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the end of this? I can say that from the beginning of our country, <clears throat> everyone talked about having a free press as being absolutely essential to the preservation uh, of a free society. Uh, James Madison uh, 
who had initially been dubious about having a Bill of Rights at all. He said, it's just going to be a, you know, a parchment uh, uh, limitation. Yeah, no, one, no one's going to pay attention, just be a piece of paper. And he was ultimately persuaded by Jefferson, uh, with whom he was very close and who he, he admired, um, and by others, that in order to get the Constitution ratified, as it was drafted in Philadelphia, they had to have a Bill of Rights. That there was more and more pressure. And every draft of the Bill of Rights, starting with the first one, written by Madison, had a press clause in it. Freedom of speech and the press. The first draft, Madison's first draft of the First Amendment in the First Continental Congress on the first day had in it a, a draft of the First Amendment which had language about how the press was inviolable. Press freedom was inviolable must be inviolable, cannot be interfered with. Um, that didn't make all the editing processes. Um, but, but from the start, and certainly with the framers, I mean, they really got the, the essentiality uh, of having a, a press free enough not to be governed by, overseen by and limited by the newly empowered federal government. I mean, remember, the reason that we have a federal constitution is that the Articles of Confederation didn't work. That, we, we, that each state had its own coins. There was no federal army. There, there were no, any diplomat had to be cleared by all 13 former colonies than now, now states. And, and so there really was a consensus. Here in Philadelphia, not far from here, there really was a consensus that there was need to, to have uh, a, you know, a written constitution uh, and a written constitution which, which dealt with the issues of this brand new country. But at the start, the first vote in the Continental Congress about having a Bill of Rights was 10 states no, no states yes. Three hadn't arrived on their horseback uh, in time. Uh, or the, the others, it was, it was, it was nine to three. Uh, and <clears throat> that couldn't be confirmed, ratified. There was sufficient opposition by, by members of the Continental Congress and then back in the states that the states would not ratify without a Bill of Rights and a Bill of Rights, whatever else was in it, would protect freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of religion. And that's the way it became and yet we find ourselves now, now back to what I'm active in, with a free press clause, which is just not very meaningful. Now, part of that is because we have very expansive protection for free speech. Uh, and so it is not as if we're not a free people without a freer press. But not having a meaningful press clause, not having uh, a individualized protection for the press, the press as opposed to speech alone, would have been a great loss. And we have it, and we're not using it. And what the group that I'm heading is trying to do is, is to make sense of that and to try to come out with some notions uh, about how to put into the press clause as enforced a much greater meaning than it has thus far been given. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Larissa, you're the Floridian on our panel. There never a lack of interesting uh, First Amendment headlines coming out of Florida. 
but the, the one I wanted to ask you about uh, for this panel uh, takes us back to the right of reply case, Tornillo, decided in the summer of 74. Um, at that moment, access was thought of as coming from, from the left. Uh, Florida now has a new social media law. It's one of those c cases we think may go up to the Supreme Court. And I would be curious if you could speak to whether you think the political valence on this issue has shifted uh, from where it was um, during that summer of Tornillo. And also more broadly, just as a constitutional scholar, knowing that Tornillo and other very important First Amendment precedent was established at a time when the press was more popular um, than it is today. Um, the social media companies may be in front of the court at a time when they are not terribly popular. And if you have thoughts about that issue as well and how the, the advocacy is impacted, do you think, by the fact that these cases may arrive at the court at a time when there is, uh, as we've been discussing broadly today, deep societal rifts about First Amendment protection, loss of trust in both the traditional and the new media. How does that, you think, impact outcomes of the Supreme Court? Well, unfortunately, I think it does impact outcomes. So the press, lots of our institutions are not very popular with people right now, including the Supreme Court itself. It's at an all-time low in terms of its public popularity and public credibility. Um, but the press, likewise, it, there's, a, there's a great book I would recommend to you called Why Americans Hate the Press and Why It Matters. And the thesis of the book is basically that the dislike of the press and the press practices does make its way into legal proceedings and curbs back in, um, even if you don't have key decisions overturned, the way they're applied gets curbed. You also don't get legislators passing laws that supplement constitutional uh, protections for the press. And then when you have juries deciding cases, for example, defamation cases involving the press, maybe they want to punish the press more. Uh, judges, too, become skeptical of press claims about press freedom. But it, what's interesting to me is this is occurring at the same time when it's becoming so evident that we need reliable information. We, the people, need reliable information in order to engage in democratic self-governance. The role of the press in fostering democracy is more evident than ever, and the lack of the, especially at the local level, the press playing this role so we can know what our government officials are up to and call them out on it or vote the rascals out if we need to uh, is so very evident. Uh, it's not surprising in a way that people are concerned about the press. I mean, the press has been, um, my co-author and I said the press, is, the press is decimated, but decimated means like 10%, right? In fact, the press has lost expertise more in the range, like newspapers in particular, about 50%. You know, in the last 20 or so years of the expertise has just been, been leached out of newsrooms. And so it's not surprising that maybe the product looks a little different, and especially at the local level, the product doesn't even uh, exist. Um, so I just think that that is something that, that Floyd and, and uh, the Yale folks need to solve. <laughs> no, somebody needs to solve it. Um, but, but, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist. I think new and different groups are coming in. There's a lot of experience with, uh, experiments with public funding, and the Internet does give us some room for experimentation with people gathering information and providing us, it to us in different ways. And you have some, some whistleblowing that's occurred by non-traditional press actors that called out. I mean, I think the Twitter files is... Uh, some of the revelations about what was going on there is akin to a Pentagon Papers revelation, and yet we ha it hasn't had the same resonance. Uh, but the uncovering of, of both the Trump administration and then the Biden administration really coercing social media to, to put their narrative across is something that I think is serious that, that did not come out of traditional press actors. Um, yeah, no, that's great. I, um, I think we have time for probably one more question that, that I could ask 
uh, of the whole panel, and you know it's hard not to be in the setting <clears throat> and not think about the majestic words from Sullivan of the central meaning of the First Amendment and the um, the artifice, you know, the image it created in our minds of the, the Fourth Estate um, and the press as the uh, bulwark of democracy, and um, but we're clearly shifting into a different era, and we've teased a, uh, a, a bit here on this panel about um, with technological change, um, as, as Floyd uh, hinted, the op chance that the court will take some really important cases um, in the coming years. And what do each of you um, think that the emerging digital First Amendment um, will look like? And I'm asking that question uh, in a week in which the Justice Department is trying to break Google apart um, and so there's this backdrop of the concentration of power of, of the tech companies in our speech marketplace. And if you have the opportunity to speak to that in your answer as well. All in a handful of minutes, sorry. Ajimu, you want to go first? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess I would, I would start by going back to where I began, which was with the values that the First Amendment was, was meant to protect. I, I don't actually think that it's that easy to take, even if you are 100% confident that the Supreme Court got it right in these cases decided 50 years ago, like Brandenburg or uh, the Pentagon Papers case or New York Times versus Sullivan, even if you feel in your bones that those decisions were 100% right, there's still a hard task in applying those principles to this very different factual landscape that we're, we're dealing with now. Like, you can believe in the First Amendment and in those principles implicitly and still not know how some of these cases should come out. Um, I think that the net choice cases, which have been you know, alluded to a couple times without actually been, being identified, there are these two cases out of Florida and Texas uh, Florida and Texas have these new social media laws that regulate social media companies. They uh, uh, require the companies to carry some content even when the companies don't want to carry it. And they also require the companies to be more transparent uh, about their content moderation policies than they would like to be. Uh, this question of how to apply 50-year-old precedents like Miami Herald versus Tornillo to social media companies is not a straightforward one uh, at all. You know, on the one hand, if you read Tornillo to mean the government can't uh, force editors, understood in the broadest sense, uh, to make decisions that the editors don't want to make. You know, can't force editors' hands. Then these laws are obviously constitutional. The Texas law and the Florida law, I mean, that's exactly what the government is doing here, right? Those governments are telling Florida, uh, telling Twitter and Facebook, uh, what content they need to publish. So if that's your reading of Tornillo, then it's relatively straightforward. But there are a lot of differences between social media companies and newspapers, and figuring out uh, which of those differences should matter, whether any of them should matter, um, uh, is, a really, is a really difficult task. And I think that uh, how the court answers those questions um, is going to make a huge difference to what the digital um, landscape looks like over the next uh, over the next 20 years, and you know we're all here because at some level we um, uh, are enthusiasts of the First Amendment. You know we all believe in the centrality of free speech to our society. Uh, I think most of us probably believe that free speech and democracy are almost synonymous. Um, uh, but you can believe all those things and still have a hard time figuring out how these cases should be decided. So I think it's very difficult to predict what the Supreme Court will do. Um, and, uh, you know, not, not always obvious even to people who, who care about free speech. Floyd? Just a word more on social media. <clears throat> we haven't talked about this Section 230 of the federal law which governs this, which basically immunizes social media uh, against uh, libel claims for what people say on social media. It was intended to, and it has, uh, allowed 
social media to explode in, in terms of its ability to, to put, in effect, people on while the social media entity doesn't have to check it. The New York Times has to check it. Uh, they even have to check it when the person is a public person in, in many uh, circumstances. And whether we're going to continue to have that, uh, uh, I don't know, but we should, uh, and I'm not even advocating one, one thing or the other. A final note for me, and now we, uh, we have, I want to save you time. If I had to tell you one thing you ought to tell your children when you go home tonight, it's that Salman Rushdie spoke to you. Yeah. Uh, and Larissa, what would be the, what you would tell your class next time you convene? Well, so last term in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court dealt with at least two very significant internet-related cases. And Elena Kagan famously said at oral argument, well, we're not the nine greatest experts on the internet. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave you with a little optimism. Because here's the thing. They waited a long, we've been dealing with adapting First Amendment principles to the internet for more than 25 years now. It's a long time. And the Supreme Court's been reluctant to wade in. There aren't that many cases, but they're finally starting to take some, which you know, makes us a little trepidatious. But, but when they adapt, in Counterman versus Colorado, which dealt with threats last term, they were very sensitive to the misinterpretation that you could put on threats in an internet context, and they, they uh, set mens rea standards high so that we didn't accidentally punish speech that wasn't really a threat. And then they rejected the invitation to uh, make you know, Twitter responsible for all extremism on the internet generated by its algorithms. And so they're, they're really trying to be careful in the adaptation of these principles. And it gives me a little hope, as, as Jamil said, the point is the principles. And uh, we reason by analogy, but sometimes the big tech uh, companies are not really analogous to anything we've seen before. They're kind of like newspapers. They're kind of like common carriers. They're kind of like this. They're kind of like that. Um, so hopefully the Supreme Court will be modest in their own abilities and be very careful in that adaptation process this term. Well, thank you. I think the three of you are a pretty great three-judge panel. I'd like to see you making the law. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for the last of our panels, we have three more of America's greatest First Amendment heroes. I'm just so excited to uh, be in conversation with them. And we're going to talk about uh, free speech on campus. Um, and uh, Will uh, Creeley from FIRE and Nadine Strosen from NYU, from, from New York Law School, and uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson from Harvard Law School have been such clarion voices in America for uh, defending free speech on campus. And Will Creeley, let's uh, start with you. So in the Mahoney case in uh, 2021, uh, uh, Justice Breyer, for eight justices, held that a cheerleader can curse on Snapchat. Uh, and he upheld the standard from the Tinker case that you can't ban speech unless it's uh, likely to cause material disruption or substantially invade the rights of others. There have been a bunch of lower court cases since then. Fire is uh, involved in some of them, and lower courts are divided about whether or not campus speech meets the Mahoney standard. Tell us about the debate on the lower court and, 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 and where the flashpoints are. Well, well, thanks, Jeff. You know, it's hard to back clean up here because there's been so much uh, excellent conversation already. It's an honor. Uh, I want to weigh into things that everybody else on the other panel said, so I will answer your question with a little bit of an answer to uh, Bruce's excellent moderation in the previous panel. Part of the job of folks who give a damn about the First Amendment, uh, and as the legal director for FIRE, I certainly lead a team of those folks, and it's my honor to do so, is to appeal to self-interest. And when I'm talking to a high school audience, as I was just a couple weeks ago, or when I'm talking to the student organization leaders at Youngstown State, where I was two weeks ago, or uh, senior leadership at Ole Miss, where I was last Saturday, 
I always try to make the point that you need to appeal to people's self-interest. Mahanoy is a great vehicle for reminding folks, uh, as Frank Lamonte, former Breckner Center uh, and former head of the Student Press Law Center did in a prescient uh, article he published in Slate just before the court's opinion in Mahanoy. Uh, Mahanoy gives us an opportunity to talk to the high schoolers in your life about why the First Amendment means something and why they should give a damn. Mahanoy involved a cheerleader who went to the Coco Hut on a Saturday night. The Coco Hut being, of course, the local gas station convenience store. And she was pissed off. Uh, and so she and her friend, in a Snapchat that I'm fairly sure she never thought would be seen by all nine justices <laughs> on the court, uh, raised their middle fingers somewhere in the aisle where the snacks and the chips are and the candy bars and said, fuck cheer, fuck school, fuck everything. Now, there's not a single person in here who I think has not felt that sentiment at some point. And certainly, the high school audiences that I talk to, as soon as they hear me curse, they say, wait, this guy's the real deal. And then they pay attention. Uh, you know, they understand that, wait a second, that First Amendment that I've just been talking about, you know, the big one with the perfect letting and kerning behind us, that First Amendment is the thing that also protects them. It's not just a parchment right, as Floyd alluded to, uh, James Madison thinking it might be, it's real because the court said that Mahanoy Area High School's suspension of her from the cheerleading squad violated her First Amendment right. Now, the school has no right to reach out into her private life on a Saturday night. They can't stand in place of the parents. You're not under, as Jamil pointed out, you're not under constant surveillance from your public high school. The First Amendment means something, even if you're a high schooler. So what Fire has been trying to do is weigh in on the lower courts wrestling with uh, Justice Breyer's three factors, right? Uh, how close the proximity is to school, whether it targets folks at school, uh, whether it's political speech. So long story short, if you're at your grandma's house and you express frustration with the principal, as a case we recently filed, you can check it out on our website, www.thefire.org, and you are punished for that post, making fun of your principal, the First Amendment has your back. And that's the message we're here to send, so please go home and tell somebody about it. Nadine Strauss, and I must thank you for your, 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 your heroic defenses of free speech. Over the years, you've seen the campus speech battles evolve in such uh, striking ways. You have a new book coming out about uh, best arguments to protect free speech and uh, rejecting the arguments against it. Um, and, and one of the big arguments that's coming up in the lower courts and on campus is that it's okay to restrict bullying. And this anti-bullying language is being used to uh, violate the Brandenburg standard and allow this suppression of speech. Tell us about this trend and some of the cases you're most concerned about. Uh, this was actually discussed in one of the earlier panels that in, in addition to the restriction which comes from Brandenburg and we think makes gr a great deal of sense that speech can and should be punished when it imminently, directly, causes or threatens certain specific harm, such as violence, um, students are saying, you know, there is real harm to my psyche and to my emotions from hearing an idea that I find offensive or expression that is insensitive. And it doesn't make any sense for the law not to give me protection. Uh, and on the positive side, these are students who have been brought up in a school and educational environment that teaches them to be respectful, civil toward each other, not to engage in bullying behavior, not to engage in harassing behavior, but to equate harassment and bullying with ideas or words that are upsetting is very dangerous because it means that we are stunting the educational process, right? As a number of other panels have discussed, as Salman Rushdie discussed right at the very beginning, we are never going to be able to develop our understanding to pursue truth to pursue any of the aims of free speech, individual self-actualization, let alone 
be engaged citizens in a democratic republic if we do not listen to others. This was Akila Mar's great point, um, including the others who may say things that we find offensive. Now, going beyond the free speech justification, uh, in a wonderful book that was co-authored by Will Creeley's boss at FIRE, Greg Lukianoff, and Jonathan Haidt, great social psychologist, The Coddling of the American Mind, um, they point out that even from the point of view of emotional well-being and mental health and psychological well-being, it is detrimental to students to shield them from ideas or expression that is upsetting or, or emotionally harmful, um, that you may think that you're protecting them, but in the long run, you're doing more harm than good. We have to cultivate resiliency and self-confidence and the ability not to let people undermine our own sense of dignity and self-confidence through words. That's such a crucial point that uh, Greg Lukianoff and Haidt made, and it's an answer to the claim that speech is violence. In fact, it's suppression that can cause more psychological harm. Jeannie Sue Gerson, in your, uh, in, in your wonderful articles for The New Yorker and elsewhere, you've painted this uh, picture about how on campus efforts to suppress speech as violence are now common. You've talked about the growing pressure for trigger warnings and how professors who teach controversial materials are criticized uh, for violence. T t tell us about the form those arguments take. How are they playing out in the courts? And how is it that there's such a disconnect between what the courts say has to be protected and what students are demand be, de demanding be banned? Well, it, you know, it goes back to something that Larissa was saying in the last panel, which is about this conflict between equality and liberty. So one of the things to remember, just even in that, that case, the Mahanoy situation, you've got the student who engaged in the speech, you've got the school, and sometimes there's another student who is offended, hurt, or feels really just like their dignity has been harmed by the speech of the one student, right? So in that case, it's really the school versus the student because they're criticizing the school, but oftentimes it's not. It is one student and another student. And then the school is kind of in the middle. Now, the reason that these uh, values come into conflict so acutely is because the, because the school also has a bunch of legal responsibilities stemming from federal agencies, such as the education department, that says to the school, if you don't do certain things proactively or remedially, to address dis incidents of discrimination and harassment, then you will be violating federal law, right? So even just the absence of action, just letting it all play out, schools can be in trouble with the government, and that would mean that their federal funding would be at risk. So they have genuine legal responsibilities that they're looking to fulfill, and because we know that lots of bullying and lots of discrimination happens through the spoken word, right, or written word on social media and other kinds of uh, digital um, uh, media. It, it's happening because you're speaking. And so at that point, you are inevitably going to have this conflict. It's not like we can turn around and go, no, there's no real conflict. They really are all compatible all the time. It's not. There really is a conflict between First Amendment or free speech values and the 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 value of protecting people and remedying discrimination. Not in every case, but in some of the really hard cases, that does happen. And the school truly, especially in the university setting, is really in that tough spot where they've got the legal obligations on one side and then the um, free speech obligations or the free, if it's not a state school, if it's a private school, often the free speech obligations are, feel even less weighty um, compared to the possibility that they're going to be both criticized by their students as not taking discrimination seriously enough and that the government may be breathing down their back. You're so right that there is a genuine conflict. And Will Curry, you flagged some of the post-Mahanoi cases. Uh, students are winning some and losing others. Broadly, are the 
equality arguments winning in courts? And could you imagine in coming years that uh, the traditional free speech uh, Brandenburg principle might be undermined? You know, I think that the previous panel uh, hit upon this in a way that I'd like to underscore here. The value of history and historical precedent in making clear to students who are, of course, tomorrow's judges and justices and leaders uh, that it protects their rights too. I'm going to go back to that appeal to self-interest. When I talk to students, when I was at Youngstown State, I'm talking to all the registered student organizations. And that includes trans students, gay students who look at me and think, what the hell does the First Amendment do for me? It allows people to bully me. It allows people to say dehumanizing things, to assault my dignity, because Jeannie's absolutely right. This is a real tension. And so I tell them the story of an Eighth Circuit case from the University of Arkansas that happened in the early 80s. I'm 42. I was born in 81. This case arises from events in 1982. So in my lifetime, this involves the Gay and Lesbian Student Association of the University of Arkansas. And they were denied by the student government $200 to show a film about Stonewall. And the reason they were denied is because they were hated. And they were told when they applied for this money, I didn't think you'd look so normal. <laughs> and why would we give you this money? That'd be like handing matches to an arsonist. The student government was in turn being leaned on by the administration, which was in turn being leaned on by the state legislature. The First Amendment had their back. They filed a federal lawsuit. They won at the Eighth Circuit. That same Eighth Circuit precedent is now relied on by evangelical student groups who say that their rights are being cut off in the name of dignity and quality in high schools and colleges. It interlocks. We litigated a case uh, in conjunction with uh, great folks at Davis Wright Tremaine, two of whom I'm now proud to call colleagues, uh, on behalf of the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws at Iowa State University. Likewise, they were cut off from benefits that other groups had on the basis of viewpoint. The way to reconcile the tension between uh, equality and dignity rights, which are serious and feel intensely personal. I'm not here to say that they aren't real um, or that words uh, can't kick your ass sometimes, because they sure can. But rather, the way to reconcile that tension is by, insist, uh, by insisting that government has no right to place a thumb on either side of the scale, that are some things, as uh, Larissa uh, wisely alluded to, are beyond elections, that there is a common ground. And that common ground is government neutrality in the face of viewpoint uh, preferences, right? Viewpoint neutrality is the way out. Everybody gets treated the same. To me, that's equality, and that's ultimately uh, cognizant of everybody's equal dignity, no matter wh whether you are an evangelical, evangelical Christian uh, or the opposite or whatever, right? It, it protects everybody. That's the point, and that's the message. Beautiful. Viewpoint equality is, uh, viewpoint neutrality is equality. Nadine Strassen, many of cases involving suppression of free speech on campus don't go to court. Uh, and uh, just recently, our friend Professor Robbie George, a distinguished conservative scholar, was uh, shouted down, I think, at a college. Tell us of that story and how, more broadly, um, administrations responding to efforts to shout down uh, unpopular speakers are suppressing free speech. Well, FIRE has been tracking deplatforming, uh, as it's called, at campuses across the country for a number of years. The trends are very concerning. Um, before I talk about this incident involving such a prominent scholar very recently, let me say, Jeff, that FIRE just came out with, together with College Pulse uh, a few days ago the fourth annual survey of student attitudes toward free speech, and this is very disturbing. This is really the nut that all of us say we have to crack because ultimately support for freedom of speech depends on the public, right? Uh, as Lauren Han said, it, it lives in, in, or dies in the hearts of men or women. And the younger generation, as has been alluded to, has some negative attitudes. Uh, the survey, which covered 248 campuses, it's the largest ever, 55,000 students, uh, very granular questions. Uh, I believe it was 49% uh, set did support blocking fellow students from hearing a speaker in at least some circumstances. Um, so. 
I think we can um, anticipate that these problems are going to continue. Robert George, who is a very respected, mainstream, conservative, uh, politically conservative, religiously conservative scholar, a political scientist at Princeton University, who has ironically been such a paragon of free speech. Many of you may have had the privilege of seeing some of the colloquies he has engaged in with Cornell West, who could not be more different ideologically. And the two of them epitomize everything that we've been extolling about speaking with and listening to and dialoguing with somebody whose views are different and how beneficial that can be to you and to your understanding and how illuminating it is uh, to the audience. To add to the irony, Professor George was discussing how the purpose of a university, the mission of a university, is truth-seeking. It was a titled lecture uh, that he had been invited to give at Washington College in Maryland. And partway through the remarks, uh, disruptive students entered chanting and um, blowing whistles and playing certain musical instruments, making it impossible for him to be heard. And I think we haven't alluded to this yet, that the First Amendment includes not only the right of a speaker to convey information and ideas, but the right of the audience members to hear information and ideas. That was thwarted. And most disturbingly, the reports are that neither the campus police nor university officials, including the president, who was in the audience, did anything to prevent the disruption. So the event was, uh, was canceled. Uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson, um, administrators have demonstrated a range of responses to shout down efforts uh, ranging from the principled response of the Dean of Stanford Law School uh, to disruptions there to examples like the one that Dean just mentioned. You are uh, a leader in the Academic Freedom Alliance, which is trying to combat this behavior. Tell us how you're trying to do that and how administrators uh, can do better. OK, so I think that um, it's, this is a complicated area mainly because we want to protect the right to protest and to dissent and to object and to speak out about things you find morally offensive, right? We want students to be able to do that. So if they're going to do that by um, coming to an event and making their views known and holding up signs and you know, doing all kinds of things to make sure that their message gets across and to really tell the speaker how much they disapprove, that should be protected, both under the First Amendment and by school rules protecting the freedom of expression. Now, when that crosses over into the line of being so disruptive that the event cannot go on, that people cannot speak, that people cannot hear, that's the line that at, at a university with the educational mission that we have, that we don't want that line to be crossed and if it is crossed, it must have a consequence if we're really going to hold to it. But this is also difficult because the area of discipline, of disciplining students, punishing them with things like expulsion, suspension, um, that is historically associated with repression of free speech and free expression and freedom of thought. That's what universities did against student protesters, right? And giving them, you know, giving them punishments and telling them they, that they would be kicked out of school, that's the kind of thing that is associated with repressive um, regimes and also with repressive schools. And so I think that this becomes a very tricky area, and that's why you see schools be reluctant when students are disrupting events to actually step in and say, we're going to call the police, or you're going to go before the ad board and have to defend yourself, and if you've broken a school rule, then you're going to have to be punished, just like someone who committed plagiarism or stole a computer, right? So I think that that's been a very difficult line for schools, and um, I will just say, I, I teach at Harvard Law School. I think at Harvard Law School, we have been very clear 
about where that line is. We have, you know, to, in order to be fair about it, you have to give everyone notice at the beginning of the year. Students have to be very clear um, that they're going to be violating a school rule when they go beyond a certain point um, in their protest, where the protest turns into um, activity that is prohibited, that we no longer consider protest, we consider it disruption. Um, and you ha the school has to be willing to actually act on it and discipline people and enforce and actually suspend. And I think a lot of schools are not there yet. So true about the importance of being clear and being willing to discipline people who break the rules and also the dangers of suppressing protests because you disagree with them. And we have in the exhibit Mary Beth Tinker's black armband. She's mm -hmm. lent it to us. Yeah. And there's a picture of her when she was a young kid sitting next to a civil rights protester who first used yeah. the, civil, the black armband. And then she, uh, just a few years later, adopted it to protest the Vietnam War. Let's talk now about the um, speech interests of professors. And Will um, Creeley Fire is representing Professor Stephen Kirshner at SUNY, a devil's advocate who was on the podcast talking about the morality of age of consent laws. His, his case was just written up in the New York Times. And there are other professors who have been fired for their speech, including those who have criticized um, diversity statements, a, a phenomenon the New York Times also recently wrote up. Tell us about those cases. Yeah, where do we start? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, be somewhat careful with my comments on Kirshner. Uh, as you note in the New York Times article today, we declined to comment, and that's because my colleagues right now uh, are in a hotel room in my hometown of Buffalo, New York, preparing for uh, their evidentiary hearing tomorrow. So <laughs> I will encourage folks to check out our website again, thefire.org. Uh, what we've seen in recent years are professors singled out for dissenting views or controversial views on matters of public concern and punished uh, for those views. One shocking case uh, that my colleague Greg Grubel is in the audience uh, litigated successfully, uh, the case of uh, Dr. Laura Burnett at Collin College who criticized Vice President Pence uh, during the 2020 vice presidential debate, uh, the one with the fly, folks will remember that perhaps, <laughs> uh, and uh, said, someone tell this, uh, this uh, guy to shut his little demon mouth up. And she didn't realize it, but Twitter being what it is, uh, for good and for ill, boon and bane, uh, the visibility of her tweet meant that her local Republican uh, state legislator saw it and, as we found out later, sent a text message to the president of Collin College in Texas and said, she's on the payroll, right? And he received a response from the president of the university saying something like, I'll handle it. Sure enough, they handled it, right? <laughs> they effectively terminated her. So we litigated. And I could go on, we've only got 15 minutes, folks. I could go on for a solid three hours with stories like uh, Laura Bur Burnett's from both sides of the ideological aisle. And for some folks who are frankly like uh, Professor Kirshner, just uh, ideological gadflies or classic Socratic protagonists who want to say, well, why do we think that's bad? Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can figure out about morality by asking questions about deeply held convictions that we have as a society. Academic freedom should protect all of that. And that's why we're litigating in uh, federal court. We have a, our appeal. We won a preliminary injunction against Florida's Stop Woke Act, which listed eight concepts that teachers were not allowed to, quote unquote, advance in a college classroom. The college classroom should be precisely the place where we have those debates. These were Governor DeSantis's brainchild. They were designed to target, quote unquote, woke viewpoints in um, California right now, we're also uh, in federal court with a new lawsuit because California community colleges now have uh, adopted an evaluatory framework, an evaluation framework for professors that measures their commitment and teaching of anti-racist principles. Now again, no matter what you think of quote unquote woke or quote unquote anti-racist principles, those things should be hotly debated in our public college campuses. That's the whole idea. You start the knowledge generating machine, then you back away slowly if you're a legislator. You don't get to push and poke and say, well, now we're a blue state, so we're going to say you can't talk about red state things, or vice versa. So yeah, we're, we're working hard to, <laughs> to protect academic freedom, but it's a full-time job. It, it is indeed, and it's so urgently important, as you just said, that you are defending academic freedom against threats from the right in forms of the Anti-Woke Act and from the left in terms of those who would um, punish those who failed to pledge allegiance to 
a particular diversity statement or a particular dogma. Nadine Strossen, tell us more about the threats on both sides. Are those refusals to pledge allegiance to diversity statements a form of compelled speech? And do you think that the threats on this count are coming more from the right or the left, or are they on both sides? Uh, definitely the threats are coming from across the ideological spectrum, including a persistent phenomenon that each side, and I hate to use the word sides because I see all of us as part of a continuum, but many of us see ourselves in tribes, and each tribe is happy to complain about censorship that's coming from the other side, but not willing to recognize that they too are engaging in it. And Jeff, if I could say, to me, the greatest threat to free speech on campus is coming from students themselves because they are afraid of their fellow students. The peer pressure is so enormous. The latest Fire and College Pulse survey showed that, you know, this is so pervasive that even the schools that had the best free speech culture because the administration was relatively enlightened, the policies were relatively enlightened. There was almost no difference between the top schools and the bottom schools in terms of student self-censorship. Uh, and that self-censorship, I was really startled to see, comes not only in the classroom, but also in individual conversations with faculty members, also in conversations with other students. 25% or so across the board said that they either very often or quite often are engaging in self-censorship. And the survey had a very specific definition that you fear punishment, either legal punishment or social punishment uh, or even physical attack. So it was a very specific definition. And the most concerning to me as an educator, 25% of students across the board, at the time that they answered these surveys, they were enrolled in college. Many of them had been there for a number of years, but all for at least a semester, that they are engaging in more self-censorship now than when they began college. So the exact opposite of what we would expect and hope for that the college experience would be something that would free your mind, that would free your tongue, um, that would open you to speaking and to listening. Uh, and that's not happening, unfortunately. It is tragic to hear that truth. And it's so important that you remind us that self-censorship and the fear of uh, uh, offending the conformity of, of the mob is perhaps the greatest threat to speech. Confirming John Stuart Mill's warning that the threats to speech would come less from government than from the, the tyranny of, of social opinion. Jeannie Souk, how are you seeing that self-censorship and fear of conventional disapproval manifesting itself on campus, and what can be done about it? So unfortunately, Harvard University, I think, may have come in dead last oh, in, yes. the, in the fire. Um, <laughs> rankings of schools, um, and there's, you know, we, we've ha internally had some debates about your methodology, but, <laughs> <laughs> but be that as it may, um, I, what I am seeing, and I'll, I'll now speak in the first person as a teacher, uh, I'm a constitutional law professor, I also teach criminal law, those are two topics in which, you know, you run the gamut of con controversial issues, um, everything from abortion to affirmative action to you know the civil rights movement and in, in criminal law you've got the death penalty you've got all kinds of uh, sexual assault um, all of the different topics that students generally today would tend to associate with the danger of getting emotionally harmed in a conversation if someone were to say something that were that they would find offensive, hurtful, you know, like denying their own identity, something like that. So those are that's just my daily teaching experience. That that's what I'm doing every day. Um, I would say I began teaching in 2007, and um, in the years that I've been teaching, everything has changed about the classroom environment. And um, 
I now no longer rely on volunteers at all um, in my classroom discussions because that's just no way to get a, a robust debate or e any kind of a diversity of viewpoints. You might get like diversity from here to here, whereas you would want, you know, you want you would want a wider range of views represented um, in the classroom. You can't get that by saying, okay, who, who's going to volunteer to say something? And mainly because of the fear, um, you get a lot of, you know, well, I don't think this, but some, you know, some conservatives might think this. Um, you get a lot of that, a lot of distancing. And then um, I think a lot of, um, I, I've had times when, you know, in, in the law schools, you, you know, you, we are, you know, our legal system is an adversarial legal system, at least in the courts. And so there is inherently a notion of there being more than one side that you would have to listen to. But on campuses today, if you say the phrase both sides, it is inherently coded as either conservative or making excuses for views that are either racist or discriminatory, right? That if you say the phrase both sides, um, that will lose a large portion of your student audience. Um, and yet, our job as legal educators is to teach students to argue at least two sides of an issue. And so I've had the experience of saying, okay, here's uh, this case, Lawrence versus Texas, you're, gonna, you're going to say Justice Kennedy's view in, in your own words in the best way you can, and you're gonna say Justice Scalia's view yes. in the best way that you can. And you know, usually that exercise goes beautifully, it does, but then you will get the students afterwards who would say, I felt really traumatized by having to listen to that, having to, having to have you, I mean, you laugh, but it's, this is like really serious. I mean, this is just, you know, I, I want to, you know, I want the professor to know, and they'll go to my teaching fellows and say, I want the professor to know she can never do that again, and she can never call on me to say a viewpoint that I might not agree with, and I won't have her ever call on me again for any issue having to do with LGBT, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So you have students saying those kinds of things, and I think that with faculty in this environment, many of them can feel scared to actually stand their ground and say, this is how I teach and I do this for a reason. I feel lucky, despite Byers, you know, views to the contrary, I feel lucky to teach at a school, Harvard Law School, where I know that the administration will have my back on matters of academic freedom in the classroom and pedagogy, right? It would never be a situation for me, I feel confident, where if I, you know, if I, next year, if I said, okay, what's Justice Scalia's view on this, then somehow I'm going to be hauled in and like disciplined or investigated for something. I unfortunately think a lot of teachers across the country would not feel the same way. Um, and it does depend sort of administration by administration, Harvard Law School may be different from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, may be different from the medical school or the School of Public Health. So I, I, unfortunately right now, we're, we have a little bit of a training gap in terms of university administrators. Mm. They've, in the last 10 years, gotten a lot of training and a lot of like, you know, raising their intelligence and their um, expertise about matters of discrimination and making people feel like they belong, that may not have traditionally felt like they've done a lot of that. But now it's time also to put in the academic freedom piece of it. That what diversity means is not just diversity in terms of your race or your ethnicity or your gender or gender identity, but also diversity of viewpoints. That is, that is in, at the end of the day, when you talk about diversity, they're all there to, because they embody different experiences and may have different views, and that is what you're gonna learn from. And I think that we've, you know, University of Lost Sight have lost sight of what the purpose of diversity is, even while worshiping diversity. Yep, exactly. That's an extraordinarily important warning and a cautionary tale. I'm, I'm teaching constitutional law this term, and I'm also asking students to state the majority opinion and state the dissent. You don't have to say which one you agree with, but just the, the skill of learning how to articulate uh, both sides is crucial to learning con law, and I have not experienced the, the pushback that you have, but it's, it's very sobering. 
We have just uh, two minutes left, and uh, we must end on time because it's been uh, a, a remarkable series of panels. I, I hope it's okay. I'm going to just take the um, privilege of, of moderating this discussion to end with the words of Louis Brandeis, because whenever I think about what I want to teach to young people and pe learners of all ages, they're encapsulated by his statement in Whitney. I can recite it now as a party trick, so, so here it is. <laughs> this, this is Brandeis, and he's just been reading Jefferson, uh, his bill for establishing religious freedom, and he's tracking Jefferson's arguments. He says, those who won our revolution, the people in Independence Hall over there, those who won our revolution, believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail against the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration. They believed that freedom to think as you will and speak as you think, that's from Tac Tacitus, are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. That just sums it up in these beautiful words, and I am so grateful to our extraordinary scholars for having come across America to educate us about the First Amendment and let the shining light of reason that we have beamed forth today inspire all of us to defend free speech in the years ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. That's great. That was excellent. Hey, thanks. That was great.